Hello everybody, a handsome man here with objectively the most oh my god is that it is no way video we have ever done because my name is Adam Cleary and these are 10 Star Trek actors whose first appearance you have completely forgotten. Number 10, David Warner. Now, as I'm sure you're all aware, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, the man who played the ill-fated Chancellor Gorkon in The Undiscovered Country also played Gul Madred in the classic Next Generation 2-parter, Chain of Command. Altogether now, there are four lights. What you've almost certainly forgotten though, and this is going to be a running theme, indeed the entire point of this entire video, is that he also appeared in Star Trek V The Final Frontier as this disillusioned Federation representative, St. John Talbo. Assigned to the Baron Nimbus III with similarly dejected Klingons and Romulans, he falls under the influence of Spock's villainous half-brother, Cybok. Now I'm sure you've seen the film, Cybok uses the representatives to lure the Enterprise to the planet for use in his own nefarious plan, and whilst Talbo appears to have a happy ending and a renewed zest for life by the film's end, Warner has actually claimed that it was originally a much bigger part. According to him, some of the scenes ended up on the cutting room floor, but the novelization does flesh out the character further. Oh, sorry, you want to know what that is, do you? Okay, Your Majesty. Apparently the character was once on a diplomatic mission, made a disastrous mistake, turned to drink, and is just this kind of tragic comic character. But you never saw that in the film. Number nine, Michael Dorn. All right, admittedly, you might know this one. All right, so yes, he had been playing Worf on TV for a number of years before appearing in The Undiscovered Country, but this was his first movie appearance in the Star Trek franchise, and technically, canon and non and non and nonically, this is his first appearance in it, and most people seem to forget it, so I'm going to include it anyway, and what are you going to do to stop me? Is it nothing? That's, that's what I thought. Colonel Worf, and yes, he is the grandfather of actual Worf, was the Klingon defense lawyer for Kirk and McCoy when they're framed for the murder of Chancellor Gorkon. Couldn't save the pair from a guilty verdict, God knows if he even tried, but he did spare them from the death penalty. Whilst it's integral to the plot, and they literally cast one of the biggest stars of the TV show to play it, Dawn's appearances are fleeting, and it's easy to forget he was in the thing at all. Not really got much else to say about this, only that I want him to have a major Star Trek comeback, preferably in his own show, but when I saw his name on the list of credits for the Picard Season 3 trailer, so I wasn't... It's not well, physically an erection, but emotionally it was. Number eight, Ethan Phillips. Now, of course, Ethan Phillips is best known to you and to me and to every single person who's ever watched Star Trek as Voyager's chief morale officer slash cook slash babysitter slash occasional security guard slash enormous pain in the arse, Neelix. Now, I know you're sitting there going, Adam, you're not going to tell me that Ethan Phillips was actually in Star Trek long before he was Neelix, and I am, dear viewer. The whole, the whole premise of this video, I am going to do that. You ready? Wait for it. That, that is Ethan Phillips. Yep, he was in the Next Generation episode, Menage à Troy. Genuinely still shudder every time I hear that name, playing a Ferengi doctor called Farrakh, who gets involved in the whole nefarious Ferengi plot to kidnap Troy and her mother and Riker, and it all just gets very, very early Ferengi. And what do I mean by very Ferengi? Well, that they can use the inherent Betazoid ability for empathy to make money, but the problem is that they're women and they don't really like them and don't think they should have clothes or rights or anything like that, and it's just, just a complete, awful, just mess. Interesting tidbit here, as well as having an absolute riot in this role, Phillips did then of course go on to play another Ferengi, albeit just Neelix dressed up as one in an episode of Voyager, and you know what else this episode is famous for? This. This is where the Picard meme comes from. The outstretched arm, the thing that was all over the internet with the two black borders around it for years and years, it's from this episode, so the more you know. Number seven, Diana Muldor. Now Diana Muldor, and I'm 90% sure it's not even pronounced Muldor, Door, but my brain is insisting that it is, replace Gates McFadden in the Next Generation second season after she had fallen out with the production team. Of course, Dr. Crusher would return and become the iconic medical officer of the Next Generation, but for that one year when she wasn't around, Muldor... Muldor? Muldor? Muldor would play Dr. Pulaski. I was gonna say Dr. Polanski there is a little bit of a riff on me pronouncing names wrong, but <laughs> I don't know, maybe a bit insensitive. Thing is though, just getting back on track here for a second, this was actually the third time she had played a doctor in Star Trek. The first was astrobiologist Dr. Anne Mulhall in the original series episode Return to Tomorrow, that's her here. And the second being Dr. Miranda Jones, a blind telepath who, let me just double check my notes here, specialises in the field of psychology. Yes, by notes, I do mean Memory Alpha. Now, Pulaski gets a rough ride from a lot of Star Trek fans, but I think it's fair to say her role as Mulhall was genuinely, universally considered excellent. 
Everyone's getting possessed left, right, and center by non-corporeal beings. She's demonstrating godlike powers and whatnot. It's a genuinely classic episode of the original series, and she is undoubtedly its highlight. And that was it. For like 20 years, she wasn't involved in Star Trek for over two decades. Yes, mostly because they were just doing films and there was nothing for her to do until she got the phone call from the next generation. Funny old game. Number six, Mark Alimo. Here's a fun game for you on pretty much any single What Culture channel. When you do a 10 point list, normally inspiration for that comes from one single source, and then we sit together as a group, yes, something like that, and we decide whether or not we can get a full video out of it. So it's always fun to guess which particular entry sparked the entire list. I'll spoil it for you now, it was this one. I was sitting there minding my own business, catching up on some classic episodes of The Next Generation, when who do I see in the episode Time's Arrow? Why, it's Frederick LaRouge, of course, and I thought, gee whiz, doesn't that demean doesn't that delivery remind me of Goldicat? When it hit me, it is Goldicat. Wow, I thought. I knew the guy played Goldmiss Set on The Next Generation before he was in Deep Space Nine, but I didn't realise he actually made his debut as a... A car dealing dandy, that's interesting. Then, months later, I was rewatching another classic episode, this time The Neutral Zone, one of my all-time favourites, when who do I see but who's... Who's that on the bridge of the Romulan Warbird? Why, it's Commander Tabok, and doesn't he look familiar? No way, I thought. I've been double done here. Not only is he in Time's Arrow, not only is he in The Wounded, but he originally debuted in the Neutral Zone. Ha <laughs> ha, my word, doesn't this guy get around. I'll have to make a mental note of that the next time somebody asks. And yet still, my friends, my jimmies had not been sufficiently rustled, because when I actually looked up when he made his debut, it wasn't in any of these episodes. Although he was uncredited for it, Mark Alimo actually made his Star Trek debut in the episode Lonely Among Us, only the seventh episode of The Next Generation as this guy. Badand. I am absolutely going to give myself forgiveness for missing that, and you are absolutely going to give me forgiveness for mispronouncing whatever that is supposed to be. You can't have two capital D's with apostrophes. I'm sorry, that's not that's not how it works. Number five, Tim Russ. Yeah, do you know what, if it was easy to miss most of these people because they're wearing loads of makeup and only when you actually get told that's who it is do you actually find out. If you go back and watch this episode of The Next Generation, you will just stop dead in your tracks and go, Oh wow, that's Tuvok. And no, I'm not even talking about his very brief appearance in Star Trek Generations where you also sit there and go, Haha, wow, that's Tuvok. I'm talking about an even more blatant one. Specifically right here where he plays Devore in the Next Generation episode, Starship Mine. If you're not seen it, the Enterprise gets evacuated for an essential Bayron sweep, a process that cleanses the ship of excess radiation but is fatal to organic matter and a crew of opportunistic thieves don't count on Jean-Luc Picard still being aboard. Forget what he's there for now. Retrieving a flute? The answer's in the comments. What follows is basically just an enormous homage to Die Hard, as Patrick Stewart is cast in the John McClane role and moves across the ship through all the tunnels and the Jeffrey's tubes and the whatnot, trying to abate the evildoers. Best bit of all, though, is that Patrick Stewart actually hits Tim Russ with the old Vulcan nerve pinch. Irony! Number four, Michelle Forbes. Now, if you've already seen our video on things you didn't know about Deep Space Nine done by <laughs> yours truly, you'll already know this, but such was the impression that Michelle Forbes made on The Next Generation that they wanted it to be Cisco's second in command for Deep Space Nine. But sadly, she turned down the role, so they had to completely rewrite the part. I had a sexual awakening to Mirror Universe Kira, and the rest is history. But it was actually the impression she made in an earlier Next Generation episode, Half a Life, which got her the role as Ensign Rowe in the first place. Now, obviously, all the Waxana Troy episodes episodes are objectively bad, but this one was surprisingly weighty. It revolves around Deanna's, how do I put this nicely, just notoriously amorous mother falling in love with a Dr. Timerson. Ooh, you go girl, a doctor, good looking, nice prospect, etc, etc, but part of a race that ritually commits suicide at the age of 60. This, of course, throws the Enterprise into the middle of a diplomatic dispute when, obviously reassessing his life as he's about to get some alien tale, the good Doctor decides he doesn't want to die. And it's left to his daughter Dara, played by Forbes, to come on board the Enterprise and convince him that Dad, for the love of God, it's Luwax and a Troy, what are you doing? And, of course, he then promptly ends it all. And fair enough. Number three, Mark Lennard. I don't think I'm sticking my neck out here to say that everybody really liked Sarek, right? It's a really interesting part, most of his episodes are excellent, and the performance itself is one of Trek's best. But despite making this part his own, Lennard's first appearance was not as a Vulcan at all, but as one of their biological cousins, playing the unnamed Romulan commander in the original series episode Balance of Terror. 
Not only, of course, is this the first appearance of Romulans in Star Trek Full Stop, but the first appearance of them to a Federation ship in canon for almost a century. Inspired by the World War II movie The Enemy Below, it's basically the science fiction version of a U-boat battle, with the Enterprise confronting a Romulan bird of prey that can cloak their presence. It's a tense episode, and whilst Leonard and Shatner never face off physically, their back and forth on the view screen is incredibly compelling. I mean, obviously it's not Sarek. Sarek was Sarek. He was Spock's father. He did the whole thing with Picard and the crying and everything else, but this, nonetheless, is still very good. Number two, Rene Abagenois. Now again, I don't think I'm sticking my neck out here to say that Odo is not only one of the best characters in Deep Space Nine, but probably one of the best characters in all of Star Trek full stop. Very easy to sort of think he got pushed out of the picture slightly towards the last few seasons with the Dominion arc kind of taking on a whole role away from the station, but when you think about his backstory and how that all led into it, probably one of the most important characters ever written for any of the shows. But he was of course, and remember this is the point of the video, no stranger to Star Trek. Two years prior to getting this role, he played Colonel West in Star Trek The Undiscovered Country. West is one of the Starfleet officers involved in the conspiracy to trigger a war between the Klingons and the Federation. He proposes the daring rescue mission into Klingon space, which would, of course, break interstellar law, and when that's promptly rejected, he just dresses up as a Klingon instead and tries to assassinate the president. What a genius. Wait, what's that? You don't remember the bit where he proposes the daring rescue mission? Well, that's not your fault. It was cut from the theatrical release. But it is in there, and it is canon. So, there you go. Number one, James Cromwell. Yes, Zephram Cockrum himself, the inventor of warp drive and one of the first humans to make contact with Vulcans, because remember, they just added loads of ones in the past for some reason. That wasn't even James Cromwell's first appearance in Star Trek, and to really bake your noodle, it wasn't even his second. And to really, really, really bake your noodle, it wasn't even his third. First off, he was hidden under heavy prosthetics to play the shifty information dealer Jaglom Shrek in the Worf-centric two-part of Birthright. He then reappeared under different prosthetics to play a minister in negotiations with Quark in the DS9 episode Starship Down, but before all of that, he played Prime Minister Nayrock in the third season episode of The Next Generation, The Hunted. Part of a season that features classic stories like Yesterday's Enterprise, Sins of the Father, and Best of Both Worlds, it's kind of easy to forget this first appearance, also because he was disguised under a mustache. You, of course, will remember this episode, though I I think because the final scenes between Cromwell and Patrick Stewart are excellent, plus it introduced the entire Star Trek universe to this particular shagger. My spirit animal. Look at him go. So there you have it, 10 Star Trek actors whose first appearance you've totally forgotten. I would love to say you've totally forgotten my first appearance on this channel, but for my sins, I have been here since the very beginning. Let us know what you made of it in the comments below. Of course, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. But in the meantime, thank you so much for watching. I have, of course, been Adam Cleary. Grab me on Twitter violently at Adam Cleary, C-L-E-R-Y, and I'll see you soon. Goodbye.